well. This past week, um, last week actually, I took the leadership team to an RTI summit, it was RTI's response to intervention um, summit, and it is an enormous, uh, very big uh, conference around multi-tier system of supports, which is the same thing as in response to intervention, it's just what we call it here in Vermont. And it truly put the leadership team on the same course for um, our belief system around what makes an effective system, as well as have a much clearer idea of the components that need to be in place in order to have an effective system. So um, that was my goal overall. We've got surveys out to the principals to make sure we've gotten to that goal, and the rest of our leadership or the, our leadership time for the next few weeks going forward will be us reflecting and talking about exactly where we are really specifying goals and then targeting where each school is currently and what we need to ensure up by the end of this year so that we can really get jump started on the next year. Um, it was across the board incredibly well received by our leadership team. It was money well spent and it will help influence our direction going forward. So I was very pleased that we chose to do it as soon as we did. I was trying I was going to do it later and, and then we changed our mind and said no we need to do it now. So I'm really excited. About that. About that I still don't know what RTI means, even though you told me what it means. Response to intervention know, or multi-tiered system of support. Oh, it's MSS. Okay. Yeah. MTSS. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Okay. So I'd be happy to field any questions about that. There's also some policy monitoring reports. Tina asked when I sat down um, if we have a schedule. So Heather made up a schedule of all the policies that have been adopted. Um, and so I'll monitor those pretty much based on the date that they were adopted. And then we started the idea of when we will bring policies back to renew and revise. We have a schedule for that as well. We have a copy of that schedule? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Please. Comments other things about the superintendent's report? Oh, great. Thanks, Libby. Uh, so, on to budget. Um, so we're going to have a discussion about transportation. Uh, so why don't we reopen uh, the mic now for public comment. Do you want to talk a little bit about how public comment is separate from board discussion? Yes. I think they're yeah. okay with that. No, I'll, I'll give a little okay. context. Um, first off, uh, I just want to state the, the board has received quite a bit of comment already in email form. Uh, the themes have been quite consistent that there is a need, particularly at the middle school, for expanded busing, that there are sections of the of, of town that um, are simply not walkable or at least not safely or practically walkable. Um, I'd say we've probably gotten 15 plus uh, such emails, give or take. Um, all supportive. We haven't received, at least haven't received anyone um, saying don't expand busing. Uh, so uh, with that, open public comment. Public comment is meant for the purpose of the board listening. Uh, it's not a dialogue back and forth. So if, if we're not, if, if we don't, if we're not verbally engaging, it doesn't mean that we're not listening and, and taking, um, taking your perspectives into account. So, um, so, since we've got a fair amount of people, if you can limit it to about a minute a piece, that would be great. Um, so whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Then you don't have to, so. <laughs> so uh, because of the nature of my job, I'm testifying as a private citizen okay. and not in my capacity as a government official. Um, my son Owen is a ten is ten years old. And oh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, Sarah Truckle. Okay. Um, so my son Owen is ten years old. He's a student at Main Street Middle School. He uh, was always bus eligible at UES. He um, we live on the top of Berlin Street, so he used to take the bus. Uh, this year has been a really big transition for that. Um, our house is not probably walkable. Um, both from a safety standpoint, he'd have to cross down through uh, the bottom of Berlin Street over to the co-op and then down through town that way. Um, so on days like today where it's icy, um, there are accidents always, always at the bottom of Berlin Street and that's uh, really dangerous. So I think if you know where I live, you could picture that. Um, I also sent around a petition 
We had 207 signatures when I checked coming in here, all in support of busing from Montpelier residents, and we did that in a week and a half on Facebook. So we didn't go door to door, we, we just shared the news, so I think that speaks for itself. I also heard from a previous Montpelier High School student who had stressed their, their times of walking from Gallison Hill Road and how much they would have appreciated busing which they've let me share. So if you're okay with it, I can read that. Sure. Because I think sometimes the student perspective would be different than those of us here. So. And just for perspective, that's up near U32. Yes, yeah. yes, actually they point that out. So they said, as a student who lives on Gallison Hill in Montpelier, the same street as U32 is located, but for some reason still within the Montpelier public school system. This spoke to me. Uh, thankful for the times I had to walk to school were few, but the long hour, at least with many questionable street crossings and conditions, the number of times my parents had to juggle rides or carpooling, uh, carpooling were innumerable. Buses would have been an amazing alternative for those kids who live in the outskirts of town, and thank you for your thoughts on this matter. So I think, I think there's a lot of support from parents. I think there's support from students who are actually in the conditions now where they're walking or they're seeing their parents struggling to carpool. And I also think, you know, we read in the news tragic stories of kids getting hit, and kids getting hit on, you know, lining up to wait for a bus. I can't imagine how much more unsafe it is for them to have to walk across really busy roads. So that's my piece. Thanks, Sarah. I'll go next. Um, my name is Carrie Saylor. Um, my family is Montpelier residents. We live up off of Town Hill Road. Um, we live beyond the end of the sidewalk, but close enough that we can kind of scuttle along the edge and get to the sidewalk relatively easily, but we've only had that sidewalk for about two years. Um, I have always lived, oh, I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, so they're both in union, they both ride the bus on a regular basis. Maybe not every single day, um, but I would say 90% of the time. Uh, I work in Montpelier, and I have with a few exceptions for the past 18 years. Um, I used to walk to work, and I, the first winter that we lived there, I walked to work and realized that the snow banks were so big on the side of the road that they went right into Town Hill Road, and I actually had to several times dive into a snow bank to get out of the way of oncoming traffic. Um, knowing that my children would have to do that, even for a few feet on their way to school on a winter day, is really terrifying. So I can't imagine that I would ask them to walk the mile and three quarters that it takes to get to school. Um, occasionally in the spring and fall, I will walk with them. It takes about 45 minutes on a really nice day to get the whole way to Union Elementary School with both of my kids. That's a really long walk downhill. We don't walk home because we tried to once and it took us an hour and 20 minutes. Um, that's a lot of time for a 10-year-old kid to be alone by themselves wandering <laughs> around town um, particularly in a space where there really aren't a lot of people. Um, Town Hill Road is mostly vehicles. It really, there's no one, you know, there are no neighbors looking out for people. It's just kind of a road that connects Montpelier to, uh, to Route 2. Um, I've also brought some comments from some other folks who couldn't make it tonight, and I hope that you'll give me a quick second to just share some of their points. Um, Suzanne Eikenberry lives on Elm Street. Um, and brought up a few points for me. She actually is able to walk her son to school every day. She's not within the bus route, but um, she asked that I point out uh, that she strongly supports creating bus service for the middle school because um, the large number of people dropping off their children at Main Street Middle School actually makes it a walking hazard for people walking to school, either children walking to the elementary school or children walking to the middle school. Um, they'll often go to Franklin Street and cross by the middle school because there's a crossing guard there. But even in that case, it's still often really difficult to see short people crossing the road. So um, that's a danger not just for the students who are there, but for the people driving and regular <laughs> anyone <laughs> walking across the street. Um, the same thing she said, they often bike, and the same thing is an issue because bike crossing is even more dangerous. Um, and she said that often the car line... Um, at both of the schools, both Union and the middle school, um, is actually, it, it, she said an environmental hazard, but also her son has asthma, and he'll often get an asthma attack if it's a really cloudy day, um, and there's a lot of exhaust. 
And much of that car line is caused by parents not being able to leave their elementary school child at home to catch the elementary school bus because there's no middle school bus, so they have to bring the middle school student down. So it's this catch-22 that parents are in with scheduling um, that causes this weird transportation crunch around both schools, not just the middle school. So adding a middle school bus would allow parents to actually put more kids on the elementary school bus and have higher usage for that too. Um, and then another parent asked me to just share just one more thing. I don't want to take too much time. But um, uh, Sue Paris wanted to be here tonight. Um, her son Erickson just graduated from Montpelier High School, I believe, last year. Um, she has a child about to go into fifth grade. And they live on Hackmore Road, which is at the end of Town Hill Road. Um, they have no sidewalk. There's a very sharp S curve with no shoulders and low visibility and another road, Murray Road, coming right into it. Um, that's the only space that her son will have to walk to school. It's absolutely impossible to walk um, on a nice day in the summer. It's extremely dangerous. Um, and in the winter, I just can't imagine putting a child there. So if he didn't walk that way, he would have to walk through people's backyards, scuttle over to Sabin's pasture, go down to Berry Street. It would be a really roundabout way to get a kid to school safely. Um, and, and for two parents who are working, she and her husband both work, but she has an uh, off schedule. She's a midwife, and she's delivering a baby right now and can't be here. <laughs> she would like to, but for her with an unpredictable schedule, it's often very difficult for her to tell if she'll even be home to take her kids to school. Um, and having a bus that was reliably there at a scheduled time to pick up her children would make it a lot easier for both parents in her household to continue working. Um, so those are my points. Thank you so much. Great, thanks. Hi, um, okay. I'm okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Rosenthal. I'm a parent of a 10th grader and a 5th grader. Um, I think since my 5th grader's in school, they've been able to take the bus for one year when they were both at the same, at elementary school together when the 5th grade was at the elementary school. <coughs> Other than that, I have been shuttling my kids back and forth since then, either b mainly from what um, Carrie had said before, because you can't have my younger one wait for the bus and get the other child to school on time. So um, my mornings start um, with having to drive both kids to school and, and doing the, U well it used to be UES and then Main Street. And it's, it's at, I'm gonna just echo what everybody else says. It's very congested, there's small streets. It's hard to get your kids around UES and M M M Main Middle School um, safely. And it causes a hazard for all of the walkers as well. What we know and what there's been research to show, and I, I didn't bring it today, I apologize, I can, I can get it to the board, is that uh, the research shows that when kids take buses, all kids are safe. You got the stop sign that goes with the bus, more kids are transporting that way, rather, so you have less just traffic around, and the kids coming and going are safer. So all of our children will be safer if we have school buses, and I, I will bring that, I will send that information to everyone. And I mean, I'm, we all know that idling cars around UES and Main Street Middle School is not good for anyone. Asthmatic kids, the climate, our, our whole community, our whole planet. So that's another piece I wanted to say. Um, and, but I think for me, one of the biggest issues and is equity. Um, as we know, most of the houses in the walkable parts of town are more expensive to live in. Um, and, the pla and the houses, um, in Montpelier, on the outskirts of town, are more uh, for um, lower to middle class families who are, are working hard to make money for their family, to support their family. And, um, and we don't have that, and the people on the outskirts of town, and I'll say where I live in a minute, um, don't have that same luxury as other families to be able to have their kids just come go, go to school on their own. We have to transport our kids. There's no way, Carrie made that clear, Sarah made that clear, we, I could keep telling you where I live and what's going on, but it's not walkable. That's just the reality of it. I live at the top of Berlin Street, um, past the sidewalks, right where Sherwood meets Berlin. It is extremely dangerous. There's um, traffic, uh, th there's accidents there quite frequently. Um, it's when people start just flying by because they're getting to the, bo um, the Berlin border. It, it's just not safe. It, there's no way I can let my little guy go. I can't let him cross the street to go visit his buddy at his house. So um, it's safety, but it, it really is 
putting families who are at a lower income at a, at a disadvantage of other families. I have not been able to work full time. Last year I tried for a year because I had busing for one more year for my fifth grader and I only had to worry about my high school student getting to school. But now um, with the lack of after consistent after school programming at Main Street um, and morning programming, um, I'm really stuck. And I think I'm not the only family in that situation. So I think it's very important for the board to consider is Montpelier um, a, a community for everyone? Um, are we supporting all of, all of the children who attend schools here? And I really feel like uh, that is including the high school. Um, are we fair? Are we, care are we caring as much about these kids, their safety, their families' um, financial well-being? Um, and are we really caring about the environment? I, I think we need to put it, you know, we, we really all have to take care of all of our kids and all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Kathleen Bryant. I have a daughter who's an eighth and a daughter who's in 10th and we live out on Elm Street. And we started having this conversation with the board about six years ago and um, it's been, I echo what everyone else has said in terms of being far enough out that it's hard for my kids to walk. They bike as much as they can, but obviously now we can't do that. And I think it's really affected decisions about our careers and our work and we haven't, my husband and I haven't been able to work full time because we have to always be there to take our kids back and forth. And um, I just wanted to speak to that, that I think that it affects people's work schedules, and I think everybody else has said the other points. But I also think that there's been some questions about high school kids, would they take the bus? And I definitely think that they would. So I just want to say that I think it's for everybody. It needs to not just be the middle school, but the high school as well, and be really inclusive of everyone. So thanks. Thank you. Amy Gendron, um, and I have three kids. Um, one is in preschool, but not at Union, and then I have a first grader and a fourth grader right now. Um, so, you know, with a child who's gonna be going to middle school next year, um, this really interests me, and it has since I moved to town. But um, we live up Northfield Street off of Colonial Drive. Um, it's about a mile and a half to the middle school, and there are sidewalks, which I'm grateful for. They just redid them in the past couple years, but, um, but regardless, you know, when you get to the bottom of Northfield Street, there's a four-lane highway, more or less. So that, even with the um, crossing signals, it still makes me very nervous for my um, will-be 10-year-old at that time. Um, so, you know, people don't always stop and they go right on red, even when the blinking thing, I see it all the time. And um, so that makes me quite nervous and it's a mile and a half is pretty far in the snow and the wetness and down a steep hill in snow and rain and whatnot. Um, so that's one of my concerns and you know this affects me and like others have said I feel like my careers and my work schedule I mean you know my husband goes to work very early I should be at work by eight o'clock so that I can take care of patients. But, you know, running late for that is quite stressful, but I wanna be able to continue to serve, um, you know, people when they're ill. So, you know, it's, it's just quite stressful. And then I heard, I was excited by the idea that there were maybe some morning programs at Main Street Middle School, but now I understand those have ended. Um, so there's not really any early drop off that's an option. And the idea of driving into that area to drop my kids off seems really intimidating. Um, There's so many cars and sometimes like, I just, I don't even know what to do. Like some, I find myself in that area on occasion in the morning and there's so much going on that, you know, even for a kid to be crossing through there seems quite scary and that a bus drop off would be a lot safer. Um, and, you know, just seeing the buses go by, I've never been on them to count the numbers, but they don't look from the outside particularly full that maybe there is room for some middle schoolers, you know, for my middle schooler to get on the bus with my elementary student. Um, maybe it wouldn't work out that way, but maybe that would be the possibility. Um, let me just look at the other points I had made of. Um, and you know, I had thought about the idea of the public taking the public transportation bus, um, but my understanding is that service that goes down Northfield Street is gonna be possibly changing and no longer going down our road. 
um, and I, maybe everything is going to be going out of national life instead and then down this way. So that doesn't seem like an option either for my child So, and my children to be coming through. So thank you for your consideration. I think it you know, would be a great service to all parents, not just working parents. You know, If you, say, have a newborn baby at home or something like that, but you've got to scuttle your, you know, your middle schooler, you know, that's a lot of stress as well. And, it seems like we should be able to offer some things. Thanks. Thanks, Avery. I guess I can speak again. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jim Hutton. I've obviously been before you guys a number of other times. Um, I, I think at this point, people have made made the point that transportation is, is um, desired and, and needed um, beyond elementary school. Um, the transportation committee that, that I was a part of, I think, went through a very thoughtful process of, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out why there's this need. You know, okay, when the kid turns 10, they can't automatically just get themselves around town. Um, we, we know that there's a need for transportation because we have three buses that do three bus routes and they're full. Uh, essentially full. Uh, I think Libby and Jim both at this point have, have checked that. Um, so we know there's a need just because those kids go into fifth grade or just because they come to the high school doesn't mean that they no longer need that transportation. So I appreciate you guys finally, you know, really taking uh, this, this topic uh, under consideration and, and, uh, and moving forward with it. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Yes, everyone. So, um, do you want to give an update on what you've been looking at and what you've been considering, or does, do we want to get quick reactions from the board first? To the Probably reactions, yeah. yeah. Reactions? I, my only question, I think, is, how, is has there been much consideration about the equity with Roxbury? Um, it's something that we have, you know, we talk about um, equity um, between where folks live and incomes and all that kind of thing. And we, we kind of made a statement early on when we did the merger that we'd be okay with not busing Roxbury families directly from their doors, uh, but instead having them show up at a, at a concentration location where they could, we could pick folks up and then get them in here from there. So using kind of a hub system in that way, um, I think we, we felt, I mean, I think the Roxbury folks felt like that was adequate, but it's certainly a very different model than what we have in Montpelier, and we're talking about changing the Montpelier model to make it even more, um, offer even more services in Montpelier, and I really have some concerns about what does this mean for, uh, you know, I think all the parents here and what we've heard from our Montpelier folks and advocating for Montpelier, um, equity within Montpelier, and I think that it's our job as a board to be considering equity district-wide. So we just have to really make sure it passes that filter for us. Other thoughts or comments? Maybe just an excuse comment just a little bit farther. I want to make sure Main Street Middle School has really been the focus of a lot of the feedback we've received as a board so far. But again, whole district, all the schools, Let's not just focus the conversation strictly on Main Street Middle School. All the elementaries, high school, middle school, really need to consider the entire picture. And I would add that um, I think I think you've got a good point, Steve. And um, I also, from everything I know about Roxbury busing, I'm not sure where it comes from. If it's the bus company or who makes that decision around what parts of the town are passable by bus or not. Um, and so there's sort of that logistical element um, that perhaps is, can't be helped. And then the other side of the coin is, is, the, is that Roxbury and Montpelier by nature are different geographically um, and population density. And so I would be interested in the administration exploring all the possibilities within Roxbury. 
Roxbury as far as like how likely is it that we could bus you know every kid from their door. Um, however, I'm not. My understanding is that's never happened, and um, and it's partly because of the distance between you know you've got five students spread out you know from one end of the town to the other. Um, so in some ways it's hard to like have equal, but it's like the, you can't have exactly the same thing for the two different towns because there's just differences in the towns. Or maybe you can, but as far as, I'm not sure we can compare them on the same exact plane. Becky, and then Bridget. Um, my last one graduated last year, but for years, it, I'm very sympathetic to what happens to your career when your children are, able, are not able to take the bus. I was working in Montpelier for the most part, and the bus was great for Union, and then they transitioned to middle school, and I wound up taking, like, I had a big car, and so I wound up caravanning four other kids to school. And I was able to do that for a couple of years, but then my work closed its Montpelier office and moved everybody to Burlington. And I wound up having to find a new job because I could not, I could not figure out how to get my kids to school and get to work. And um, I think that happens a lot around here. And I think, it, I think it's actually born more, if I may say so, by single parents. I didn't have an option. I didn't have anybody else to pick up the slack for me. So speaking as a parent is separate from school board. I would really like to see this move forward. Bridget? I just wanted to respond to some of the other thread about the district-wide approach to just say that I don't think transportation is ever going to be a one-size-fits-all solution in a rural state. And although it's important to be looking at the district as a whole, I don't think I necessarily need anybody to implement in every part of the district because the nature of the, the area, the age of the kids, the nature of the school, and whether it's an open campus and kids are going all day versus a fixed schedule, all of those things are going to matter when you make transportation choices. So I agree with um, Yes, big picture, but not necessarily identical solutions all the way across the district and across every school. I think I'll say I do live at the top of Berlin Street that um, we don't now necessarily pick you up at your door. So considering the possibility of uh, pick up places that were closer, so you weren't working, walking a mile and a half, but were closer to your house, um, might be a possibility. Like, like where Berlin and right. Hebert come together for, the, for that right. neighborhood. That right. happens already. Mm -hmm. Right, so, it, so it's not like a... It actually feels like the Roxbury framework would probably be applied in one other situation also. Well, I'm extremely sympathetic to this as an individual who walks a mile to and from work every day and fell twice on my way to work today. And fortunately, a neighbor came by and gave me a ride on the icy streets. And I was definitely thinking of our students as I was uh, um, heading into the office today. One thing, though, that, that I keep thinking about throughout this all, and um, it ties into some of what Steve and Bridget were just talking about, is whatever approach we take, and I'm, I'm sure this is on Libby's mind and the administration's mind, I really want us to also consider the environmental sustainability of it. If we have a bus that's picking up three or five kids and isn't totally full, I, you know, I, I want to be able to provide a transportation solution, whatever it is, but I, however we do it, I want it to be environmentally and economically sustainable. Um, for our community, and I think there are plenty of options to do that, but um, that's, that's my piece on that. And to add to that, um, I wonder, and we haven't heard from Libby, but whether you talked about the bus system that's the city bus system, whether we can't talk to city bus systems, so perhaps they could help us out with this issue. I don't know where I've we are. I've talked to them already, right? it's right. pretty much a moot point. They're not going to change their system for us. <laughs> They'd have yeah. to do that. They made that pretty clear. Okay. Yeah. yeah.
No, no, we've been trying to engage them for a while because it didn't I seem knew, to, and yeah, yeah, and it's it's yeah. You know, That's the way Burlington gets their children to school. Really public sorry. transportation. A lot of cities do that. Yeah. Right. Look, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but a potential data question. So thinking about the parents and kids and buses and cars, do you have any idea how we're doing for the students in UES and mainstream middle school getting to school on time? Hmm. Do we have I don't have exact data. I couldn't pull out exact numbers from I my head. Um, I would say that there's probably a bit of lateness because of transportation issues for kids on their own to get themselves to school with lots of fun places to stop in. <laughs> yeah, distractions might yeah. be a good word. <laughs> um, particularly here at the high school. And but a little bit at the middle school too. I'd have to ask Pam and Mike for exact numbers around that. And we wouldn't be able to name the exact reason. Sure, for the why changes it's throughout late. the year in December yeah. and January when the streets are really nasty, if it gets worse or better in the spring. It's yeah, nice. I don't know if we could we could really nail it down to that sure. great size, but you, I could ask their perspective, and I can imagine what they say. But it was just trying to figure out whether or not there was something to support. Yes, mm -hmm. it's not working at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just anecdotally, I mean, you know, when you've got a day like today, I, I, I was, yeah, I mean, I passed by Union after dropping off my childhood at Main Street at 818, and there was a line pretty much all the way down School Street of people waiting to drop their kids off, and that was three minutes after start. And the, you know, the, you know, the walking school bus, which is kind of the one like guided walking option, <laughs> was also about at Mangy's, so they were going to be five minutes late, and, you know, the kids were slipping all over the place, so it was, um, you know, weather definitely makes Adam, worse. Adam. Sorry, that was a bit rude. Um, on Wednesdays, they do start 20 minutes later at uh, MSMS. I don't know about you yet. The U.S. starts at the same time, and MSMS starts at... 8.20 Eight twenty or eight fifteen. Eight fifteen. Eight fifteen. Other questions or comments? I'll just say. I mean, I've. It's probably a lot of you know. I I run a lot, um, and I've <laughs> I've been on all the roads and kind of all the you know, the far ends of Montpelier in all sorts of conditions. And, you know, places like Allison Hill Road, Bliss Road, there's there's no way you can safely walk, um, a 10-year-old can safely walk from some of those places to school. Um, so there are real safety issues. Um, and equity issues, too. That's, that's where a lot of the um, more affordable housing is. Uh, I think there's don't have data to back this up, but my guess is there's probably um, higher levels of single parent homes in some of those areas. Uh, you know, some of the so the challenges to the families that live in some of the places that are more challenging to begin with, um, I think, are steeper. Are you okay? Tell us yeah, you've, yeah. You've looked at. And I would echo that. Carrie was nice enough to drive me around uh, Montpelier. <laughs> And I was amazed that we have such a rural city <laughs> in some spots. I didn't know that. It was great. Um, so I've been looking into, Grant and I have been looking into a couple different options. And uh, we have a meeting actually with Stacy at STA, which is our busing company, on Tuesday. And the only reason why it's on Tuesday because it was the, only, the first time that Stacy, Grant, and I could get in a room together based on schedules. Um, and I also have a... Jim and I have a meeting on a Tuesday morning with several several people who were here that was just planned for Main Street Middle School. We have budgeted for two buses. We don't know if we'll need two buses, right? The high school question is interesting because we haven't necessarily dug into high school as of yet. Um, and I think if talking to Mike McCraith, I'm not sure how much of a maybe in the maybe in the ninth grade. For our high school students, there'd be a desire or a need. High school's just a different beast. For many things you pointed out, Bridget, of kids coming and going and different places that they're going to and, and the wonderful um, community programs that we have here at the high school. It's just it's just a different world. And we have students from other um, schools for school choice coming in as well. So I'm not sure about the high school. We haven't necessarily put that on our radar just yet. Um, if the board tells me to, then we will. Um, We've really been focusing around Main Street and those far corners of our town. Um, and we're going to propose to Stacy to 
not not necessarily pick up every Main Street middle schooler, but the ones who live outside of certain areas of our town. That's what we're going to propose, and we would change the bus routes of UES so that more so it would even out the kids on the buses. We wouldn't just add to the current UES route. So what we're going to propose to her is if we add more buses, that would level out more UES that would thin out the UES kiddos on those buses, so we could fit Main Street middle school kids on them as well. We do in our policy now, don't we not pick up uh, closer to school? Uh, we pick up all, we, all our UES kids have access to the bus, whether they take take that or not. Yeah, whether no. they choose to no. do that or not. No, I think there's, there's a no bus routes in, no? in the first mile or whatever. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then I'm assuming yeah. that Susan told me that. Because okay. I was thinking if you think a mile out for everybody. Yeah. And it's not an even mile. It's, yeah, that's the problem. Our town's not mm, that it's, even. <laughs> you know? it's, well, but I mean, if we've got a, a parameter determined by I don't know what for the little kids, then it seems like that could be also a parameter yeah. for the older yeah. kids. Yeah. And we very well could think that way, right? Um, there are places like, I don't want to butcher the street, is it Berry Street? Mm. That is pretty city-like still. Um, and with a relatively easy way to get to town, that could be a mile, you know, mile point three outside of the school or away from Main Street Middle School, but it's still a pretty easy walk through um, town to get there. So there's some things to consider. Do you still pick up kids out there or not? Um, so there's just many things to consider in this, and I want to talk to Stacy to see if our plan is even a viable one for the bus company. Another option is to do change school times considerably and do two bus routes. So pick up elementary school kids, get them to school, then pick up middle school kids, get them to school. That's another option. Um, I think if the principals watch this video and hear me suggest that option, they'd be shaking. Yeah. <laughs> that's changing school schedules is like, that's a big deal. Um, so how would we do that? Well, it's a, would be a very big question for us. That would change a lot of things in the school system. So there's there's things to there's multiple options that we're considering. We're just we have to get with the bus company now to say what's what's the most feasible, economically sustainable, um, and best for our kids. I guess I, I just have one question: When you're figuring it out, have you assessed at Union how many kids would actually wind up on the bus if there were buses for the middle school too? Like in, in the situ there's many parents in the situation I'm in where my elementary school student couldn't take the bus because I had to bring the other ones to Main Street. So you're, I, I'm thinking that your bus use is going to get higher at Union, and I didn't know if that was factored in. Not yet. Thinking, but it, it, it will change the bus ridership. What we do know from Union, from the from the STA, is that because uh, we asked them if our buses were full, if, we, if there were any room just on the Union buses, right? And they said that if every kid were on the bus, they would be full. So it's not just adding kids onto the buses we already have. It's how, I guess I'm a little um, <clears throat> not clear on process here in terms, I mean, we definitely want to delegate the fine decision making to the administration on this, but we want to have it, since we are in the process of, of policy rewrite, we're also thinking about the values that come to this and how those values guide your decision making. And I guess I'm I'm sensitive to the you know the values you all are kind of considering as you put this together, where those values come from, and which values you're prioritizing over others. Um, I have I'm, I'm really concerned about this Roxbury thing, and I think that I I would like us to make sure that we have really process that. Um, I, we have no participation from the Roxbury community in this conversation. When we Even our language in this is very much about our town rather than our towns. And I, I really think that we need to be cautious about moving forward with a, a new busing expenditure without having a really rational value system that, that creates whatever we create. In other words, we need to be basically be able to, to, to document why we're doing it the way we're doing it. So I just I just want to caution us not to to do this because we're hearing a lot of concern about this in the community right now, but that, you know, I think that most of us would like to bus everyone um, and that we believe that it's environmentally better and it's it's better for equity and all those other reasons. And the, and the problem is we're actually leaving a lot of people out of the busing and we're having to choose who we're leaving out. So 
I just, it, I don't know if it's a question so much, it's just a, a caution is just that we can all make sure that we agree on the values we're using as we go forward. I think I would need to know more, I would need to know more about that, because I'm not, yeah. I'm not positive what, I don't know what you mean when you say which Roxbury students were leaving off buses. Um, so, and I'm not sure. sure, I haven't heard, while I've heard from Montpelier community members, I've heard from Roxbury community members, but more because the bus is late sometimes on crappy weather, <laughs> like, like yesterday, or um, the bus driver was driving too fast, but not in terms of the service that we're it's, offering them, so I need to know more. Right, no, and all I mean by that is that, you know, if a parent has, to, there's an expectation for, if we want to talk about the equity of, you know, where people live and their income, we have to look at Roxbury as an even lower income community than, than Montpelier in many areas. And, you know, in terms of the ability, the requirement in the economics of a family unit, in terms of having to, to allocate time to move their children around, their kids are not going to be walking from their home to the Roxbury Village School so that they can get picked up by a bus. Um, they're going to be dropped off there. I mean, maybe there are some kids, I'm sure there's some kids close in who do that, but in many cases, the parents are still basically busing their own kids um, in their family trucks and cars. And so what we want to do is think about what, how much are we making them do that and whether that's consistent with what we're doing in Montpelier also. Um, if they're driving them two minutes and there's no big deal, that's great. Um, but it's just, I just want to make sure we're doing apples to apples. You know, the density questions, the feasibility of those things is, are important from an economics perspective, but not so much from an equity perspective. I think it's interesting that you haven't heard from Roxbury because uh, with a new system, new busing, it seems like if it w if what we're doing now wasn't working, we would have heard, mm -hmm. or they would have heard, but I don't know that. I mean, it is safe to say that for the middle school and the high school families, what we have right now is a huge load off of those families. Right, we've moved I mean, in that direction. Right, them. we're moving in that direction, and it really is I don't think there is a clear answer on how we're gonna be able to compare the equity between the two communities on this, because it's it's not practical for a Roxbury bus to go door to door and pick up all the kids. It's just not practical. Well, like in bud season, could the bus even make it? <laughs> it, was right. it was only four years ago that uh, the bus actually went on a single dirt road in town. Before that, it was picking up the children on Highway 12A or 12. They had certain locations where the bus would stop and pick the kids up. I, mean, I was thinking to myself in some of this conversation Monday, two days ago, there was a hiccup with the bus. Um, the bus driver thought it was a holiday and didn't drive. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a strange morning, waiting for the bus, road, waiting for the bus that didn't come. That's classic. But the interesting thing is, when I asked my son, after I picked him up at the bottom of the hill for the walk up, we were talking, how did school go? Was, were there any kids out because the bus wasn't there? He said, no, everybody in his class was there. Um, and again, it's... We had five students absent that day. I do know that. Were there some? Yeah, there was okay. five students absent, but who knows why they were absent. Sorry, six-year-old perspective is kind of... Exactly. Yeah, that's probably it's pretty typical right. for their student population. Yeah, but it really is... I mean, I'm... A lot of the parents tonight have said, a lot of the parents on the feedback we've heard before, it's, it's tough managing your schedule to get the kids here and get the kids there. It really is different in Roxbury when if you choose to live in Roxbury, you're choosing to drive at some point in time. Um, and not that it's easier necessarily because you've made that decision, but I think ultimately most families living up in the hill somewhere know that they are gonna be driving and they'll be working schedules out. Um, whether or not that's always, it, it's not always easy. It's definitely not. I know that there are families who have had a hard time getting their kids to preschool in town. Um, I live at the UNW and have a couple conversations about busing for preschool kids to make sure we have some clear expectations there. But I do know that in the past maybe four or five years, we have heard from families that you know if they couldn't use the village school, they wouldn't be able to get their kids to preschool somewhere else. Um, so yes, transportation is a tough thing. I guess, but we're expecting those parents to, we, we had, there's this different set of expectations, right? So we're saying that we would expect a Roxbury parent to just handle it. To make accommodations. But we're, we wouldn't expect a Montpelier parent to handle it. And I, and I don't think that anyone's saying that necessarily, but it's really close to that. And I think that right. what we, I think that we've, 
we've added busing services for Roxbury in the in the merger of the towns. So what we've got is some really good will right now, I think, and um, we've made a good step forward for everyone. Um, and I think we want to do that for Montpelier too. And the question is, does that then throw that out of whack again? And now we all of a sudden we hear from and say, hey, but you know, you're adding tax dollars, Roxbury tax dollars, to do this, and you know, it doesn't seem like an equitable equitable thing. So I think I'm just wanting to, I'm just wanting to be that kind of conscience a little bit about are we are we truly being equitable in terms of you know if we talk about the economics of family income and distance from schools and the burden we're placing on single parents or the burden we're placing on people who have to think about their jobs and how that equity you know it is still affecting those Roxbury families too. And to the credit of Roxbury residents throughout this entire merger process they have said we have low expectations. <laughs> You know, I mean, we've heard that over and over again when it comes to transport. We have low expectations. So, you know, there's not like a big selfish demand or anything from Roxbury. It's not that. I'm not sure they said they had low expectations. I, I don't mean but about I the whole they, school system, but they, the transportation. Yeah. Well, but I think, I think they were used bad. to, I think Vermont mm -hmm. is like the dilemma we're in. There are rural parts of Vermont. If you live out on a dirt road, yeah. I can tell you the buses don't go there because they can't during two seasons of the year. Sure. That would be the mud seasons. So, you know, it, it, it equitable is difficult. Yeah. They did say they, they were, they, we, Montpelier residents were actually advocating for more busing for Roxbury during the merger conversations. Then we actually brought it up as the problem. Like, hey, how are we going to do equity in transportation? How is that going to work? And the Roxbury people were like, we don't really, have equity in transportation. It's just the way it is when you live in a rural town. And we're like, yeah, but if you're gonna, if we're gonna all be together, we're gonna have some equity in transportation, and we're gonna do, you know, the after-school bus, the extracurricular bus. Like, that was something that we really, the Montpelier folks really insisted on in that process. So, you know, I think it just to be consistent, I want to make sure we think of these two towns as one district. I actually forgot that piece of. Sorry, Brian. I forgot that piece of um, the planning from earlier that I just thought of the Colonial Drive area there, like that Roxbury bus already passes through it, and that's certainly not a full bus. So um, so that group of kids could easily, so when we're talking about where we'd be picking up, that we already use that wow. bus, so yeah. we'd already we'd already have that option. I just forgot about that part of the plan, sorry. No, that's actually part of the point that I wanted to make in terms of equity. Uh, <laughs> I have had a conversation with a couple of folks in town, and this has come up, yes. The bus coming from Roxbury is going to be coming through Montpelier. It's going to be going past houses. And obviously, the Montpelier kids are going to be going for a longer bus ride. It's inherent by nature. But I do think we need to be careful to not start using that bus to make a ton of stops in town and to actually start an entire new route. I think what you could do, yeah. and I have to talk to Stacy. This, this is beyond like my favorite. Right? Yeah, yeah you, right. you stop right at the bottom of Colonial Drive, where those neighborhoods let out sure. for the middle schoolers, and just have the middle schoolers get on, because it goes up into the neighborhoods with the UES bus, but with the middle schoolers just stop at the end right. and have them get on at so the end. So it's not a considerable. Anything, it so the concern is just difference. making it even longer? Yeah. Is that yeah. the exactly. concern? Okay. Yeah. Right. I just said two pieces of, you had talked about the map. Um, I had the opportunity to sit with Chris Hennessy five years ago. And there are actually, the school district actually has maps with the um, the, the circles, the, uh, the, ra the radius around each school drawn out. And, and that was used, I don't know, probably in the 90s or the 80s to determine which kids would, you know, could walk. You know, and then, and which kids would be bused, and then I think there's consideration for difficult streets and neighborhoods. Yeah. But there is, there are some maps in existence um, that we are. Last, last I know, Chris Hennessy and Brian had, uh, Rick had, they exist. And, and just, uh, the other point being, <laughs> I do see. not, you know, no, nobody in the town, I think, at this point, has ever expected door to door service. It doesn't happen now. Our kids go to school buses, uh, school uh, bus stops. Bus stops. stops. So go going to bus stops, um, and and honestly, we're not having. I don't think anyone's been asking for anything. In a lot of respects, anything new. We started in the school system. These kids got bus to school, and all of a sudden, the buses disappeared. So you know, you know, we yeah. had buses, and then they get taken away at an age. So it wasn't that you're 
adding new bus routes. It's just incorporating the other two schools into the same existing bus routes. And the whole sibling thing is really a, oh, an amazing factor in all this. You know, and I, you hear it from a lot of parents. It, it'll be true for anyone. You know, the, the kind of the lunacy of it all with the sibling issue. That we usually don't call the I think it's interesting to get a conversation around equity because when you read about equity in white papers and you research it or you think about it from a policy perspective, equity doesn't always mean equal, right? It doesn't always mean the same. It's it it means well actually I should have reversed that. It doesn't mean the same. It's providing equal access when you think about it from that perspective. I know for me as a Montpelier parent, I would have no problem with my child going across the street, I mean, I live right across from Hebert, if they had a group stop there. Um, but I think when you're talking about values, I can see for me as a parent, where I'm putting my number one value is safety. And that's what it comes down to for me of why I want to see busing at Main Street Middle School, because I truly do not feel like my child has a safe way to get to school unless I drop him off. And I would like to see the conversation be more centered around those values around safety and not so much about, I think we have opportunities for public comment. That's such a great process. People are here, people wrote letters, people have sent, submitted emails, people have spoken to every one of us who's on the transportation committee. But I think we're, we're gonna have that opportunity to have that discussion if that's something that we move forward with. But when you think about values, I think about safety. And that, to me, is the center of all of the comments that I've heard. And that's the one thing I think we can all agree, that we don't want to see a child get hit crossing the street. And I, I saw a, a bus in Montpelier the other day where they had the stop sign, and the kids were running out in front of the bus without the stop sign up because traffic was just so hectic. So we already have problems with safety as it is now. And I, I just think it's important to bring that value. I think that's where parents really are concerned, is looking at these icy days and sitting there thinking, how is my child gonna get there? You wouldn't wanna walk the mile this morning, your neighbor picked you up. I don't want my son getting in a car with a stranger, but any decent human being would do that we tell our kids over and over again, don't talk to strangers. Make sure you're aware of who you're with. Unfortunately, we live in that world. So that's, I think when you talk about values, you have to think about the values that affect all of our students. And I, I just want to piggyback on that. It's, it's, it, affects the safety, lost control. it affects the safety of all the students, all the students, because of the congestion around those schools, including the Roxbury students coming in and out of their buses too that we just have so much congestion around all those schools um, that there's a lot of safety issues for all students in Mom, in, that are coming and going in, into the Montpelier schools. And I'd love to know why there's not more talk about the high school too, because I see that being an issue too. You know, I mean, I don't think that high school kids can get safely to school most of the time, you know, with living two miles out of town. And I think that affects work too. So I would love to see more conversation at the upper ends. I'm kind of surprised that hasn't been part of this, too. So I'm going to yeah. Th yeah. Yeah. thank you. I, I, I let public comments slip a little bit. Uh, <laughs> normally, we don't do that. But the comments you all raised are, are very good. So we really keep public comment to public comment. But, um, but thank you. For doing. Um, since the topic is transportation and not just busing, I just wanted to raise something and not, not to ask for an answer now, but some input, input at some point um, as the budget is going about the crossing guard issue and mm -hmm. having more crossing guards for a while. Because I just wanted to be like, again, not putting anyone on spots that I didn't really at the time, but it is another transportation and safety issue. It would be easy to turn some input on through yeah. the process. That's a good point. In my center, it's just hard to get and retain people. Um, we've got a few gems who, but you know, some crossing guards come and go. Like for instance, for a while we didn't have one at uh, School Street and Main Street, and now we do. And there used to be one at Elm Street. Yeah. There hasn't been for a long time, and we 
I was not trying to start the discussion. There could be, be a couple more beyond that. <laughs> yeah. Got it in red. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, we haven't talked really about the activities bus that goes to Roxbury after, mm -hmm. you know, some of the after school activities at the middle school. Um, but I do think that's also an important um, service to continue. And I, I've talked to folks about usage and all yeah. that and challenges around that. But I think that's one piece where equity like, is where it's, it's something that Montpelier's not going to have, but that Roxbury, that it can be really important for Roxbury yeah. for that equal access to the extracurriculars. Well, and I think that's where we get where equity doesn't mean equal. I mean, that's, you know, by, by its nature, I mean, even if we do funnel points in Montpelier, those points are probably going to be, on average, shorter than funnel points in Roxbury. Um, but there's also things like nobody in Montpelier, even the people, you know, out on Bliss Road, are not going to have an activity bus. So, are you thinking you're going to get what you need from SGA by budget deadline? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll have a plan. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone um, for the great input. This has been very helpful, and thanks, Libby, for being with us. Yes. Um, ready to move on to board governance? So I just um, kind of doing a mid-year progress update. Um, I had two items for this. One is kind of how committee structure and how we run committees. And then as part of that, um, some discussion about the negotiations committee and the makeup of that. Um, and then the third is just, ch or the second is chain of communications. Um, I want to just start with chain of communications um, and kind of how to communicate with uh, administration members and kind of like what hat you're wearing. Um, <clears throat> the issue, and I think this has kind of been something we did in the past, is there was a pretty loose relationship between communications with the board and communications with administration members that it didn't always funnel through either the superintendent or the board chair. So there was a lot of kind of communication between board members and principals or board members and curriculum directors or board members and special ed directors. Um, the problems with that is it kind of, I think, has created some confusion on the part of the administrators about how that board member is speaking, whether they're speaking on behalf of the board, whether they're speaking individually. Um, sometimes it's been requests for information that have kind of been taken as directives. Um, so I'd like to tighten that up a little and have requests. If, if, you're, if you wanted information from, say, Grant or Mike or Mike McCraith or you know Mary or whomever, um, kind of as a board member seeking information to send it to Libby and me, and then we can forward it on and just make sure it all gets funneled. Um, if you're speaking as a parent, of course you can go to directly whoever you want to go to. I think given that the line between a board member and a community member is pretty hard to distinguish once you're a board member, I think the only way you should go directly to, to an administration member other than Libby is as a parent and really keep that parent hat on and make sure that your discussion as a parent doesn't slip into a discussion as a board member, which I think can happen if you have like a specific request about you know, something that's going on in the classroom and then you get a response back and then that kind of edges into, well, I kind of think this should happen in the school. Um, you know, kind of be careful of that and, and where those lines are. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, set those lines out. I think it'll be easier on the administration. Um, I think it'll, it'll clear up any lines about whether you're speaking as an individual or as a board member and, and, and kind of Libby and I can clear that up when we pass the request along. 
Um, and I think it'll just be neater, and I think it's kind of the, the form that most boards follow, um, and we just have it for several years. So any questions about that? Yes, I'd like a clarification, because I thought if I had a question, I sent it to you. You can send it to, yes. Not to Libby, well, unless it, well, like, no one less. And that I send it to you, you make a decision about whether Libby needs to yeah. be brought in or whether you have the answer to my question. Yeah. I think it's okay to CC both of us. You've, I mean, I'm, I'm okay just okay. having to go to me. Just um, the policy set? Yeah. The policy, no, but it goes yeah. to the superintendent, copy to the chair. And the I think that's chair. what the policy says, yeah. You wouldn't have a conversation with somebody this side without yeah. including the board chair. Right. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think the, the main thing is to make sure that Libby and I are the funnel. What if you're dealing with the, and I realize this is like um, the exception, but for example, some of the paperwork for becoming a board member, uh, Joanne reached out to me directly because, um, I, yeah, she just reached out to me directly, and so then I, I, I need to clarify some things with her. I think that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if, if it's truly like logistical, logistical administra okay. administrative, but. Not um, only that, she called you, right? And she, she also reached yeah. out to you. Yeah. I mean, I think if, yeah, I think if someone reaches out to you, you can answer okay. a question. And if, if it's really road administrative, you know, just can you drop this form off or whatever, um, I think the line is, you know, err on the side of going through us. Um, and I think the, you know, the danger of kind of thinking something is just a quick administrative question is it, it might be looked as a directive. Like, can you know, I'd like to know this number, mm -hmm. but this number might be really complicated. Or, you know, is that a directive? Like, I have to get that number to, mm -hmm. you know, him or her right now. So, and so when we're working on the finance committee with Grant, for example, um, and I think we're copying Libby on pretty much all of those communications. Yeah. I can't think of any that we didn't. Do you want to be copied on those as well, Jim? Because you might get, I'm just thinking um, about that, like with some of the subcommittee work that where there could be, like this past week, for example, with the negotiations committee and with the finance committee, there were a lot of emails back, bouncing back and forth. And Libby was copied on, I think, all of them. But I don't know that you were. I wasn't. And do you really want that to be the case? Or no? I'm just trying to I think those, those questions guys. would come to Jim and I, and then I, we'd we bring them to Grant. Yeah. With what okay. Jim's saying. Yeah. Go ahead and copy me. Um, I can always do a quick look and ignore contact Libby and say there seems to be a lot of traffic around this today. I think that these are all good things. Um, I guess I have a question about to what extent the onus falls on the professional administrators to be able to navigate this also. Um, you know, our roles as community members, parents, board members, they're very fluid in the sense that we're always talking to other, our neighbors who maybe are also teachers who are also, or someone who might be a formal, former, you know, whatever. And it just, it's, you know, I think, you know, I mean, I can think my own interactions have been pretty, I, I usually go in saying, I'm writing this email as a parent today. You know, I'm always very clear about that, but, um, but I think that uh, it would be great if we, if administrators were fluent in how to, in what those roles are and what the, how the board members do not speak for the board when they're approaching somebody individually. They don't actually even have a right to ask for you to do any research or do anything, frankly, um, that has to go through their boss, basically. Um, you know, I just, I just want to make sure it's clear that like, I would really love it if, you know, when I sit down with Pam to go over my daughter's stuff and we start talking about some other issue that she can say, you know, I want to make it clear right now that X, you know, or that, that I'm, I'm here talking to you as a parent. Yeah. Um, I so, mean, you know, it's harder for a teacher, right? They're not an administrator. Yeah. Bridget? I, I guess I think the owner's on the board member. I think the owner's on the board member, too. And we need to own that, and we need to be careful about it, and we yeah. need to respect Libby's authority and her role as a superintendent and respect our roles. So I don't think it's I disrespectful. Not, not intentionally or personally, but I just think in terms of how 
how you look at the, the roles between the board and the superintendent that in fact channels develop with um, other members of the administrative team. That's, that's circumventing the person who runs the district, and that's, hmm. that's yeah. not supposed to work that way. So I, mean, you know, I, do, I think we really have to own that responsibility as board members to make sure we understand and, and I think we, we, we have to own the power structure, too. Yeah, I and was going to say, it's, you are their boss. Yeah. yeah. And, and whether you who's boss? want to, everybody's yeah. in the district. I'm not, I'm not Pam's boss. Well, yeah, yes, but you're, but you're, you're, you're <laughs> Pam's <laughs> boss's <laughs> boss. <laughs> sure, yeah. but, and so, so. When, but what I'm saying is when you go in, even if it's not your intention, you have some innate authority. Do you have authority, other, authority yeah. because you're on the board. So you might not mean it that way, but it's hard for somebody not to take it. Then. Yeah, or to tell you, you know, yeah, sure. Stop I, talking I, about that because you're a board. I, I get it, but I have yeah. a lot of faith in the professionalism of our of our especially our administrators, and I think they can easily be trained in well, that too. I'm not saying we should be abusing it or any of that nonsense, but I'm I'm not even Libby's boss, right? Like I'm pretty clear on my roles here. Um, as a, one no, I, I, no I, I, I'm only her boss as part of a yeah. of a group, right? So I would have no individual right to even ask her for anything. No, but so it's you know it's not like I'm trying to abuse something. What I'm doing is I'm saying these things these things require that the professionals, the people who are you know full time paid, they should they should understand these roles also. Is all I'm saying. Well, I mean I I think they should understand that, but I think we should. We I think the onus should be on us to be very mindful of how our interactions with administrators are taken, sure. and, and the fact that we have isn't that in our policies already a power leverage over them. We do the same. Yeah. So we have a little bit of time, right? We're not really behind time. Yeah. No, I think we're ahead of time, actually. I, mean, I think it's a really important topic, and it would actually be helpful for me, which really is a parent role, which does. Sort of it is hard. To just talk more specifically about where. It's very easy if it's you know your kid having a problem in your class. That there the line is is easy and you kind of understand it. But you know if as a parent you're sort of seeing what's going on in the school and it sort of involves your kid, but it's also a, it's like you know I think I think we need like another coach for this team, or I think you know we don't have enough resources in the cafeteria. You know what I mean? Like you sort of see things. Yeah. I think you know we should be more express really about where that line is because I, I do think. Because we're board members, you carry a different responsibility if you're going to a principal to raise issues that are going on in the school, even though they do affect your own child, but they're really more programmatic issues. And is that, do you think that line, you cross that line somewhere before you get to saying, you know, why doesn't the library staff for more hours? I'm just going to make you think of that to try not to personalize it, but you know what I mean? Where do you think it is? I'm, I'm not sure where it is. I mean, I think to be safe, if it goes beyond issues very specific to your own child, um, you might not have crossed it, but you're inching towards it. And I think also, like what I'm tempted to kind of notice or bring up those issues, I realize I have this role, that I have kind of a unique ability to notice those and then bring them to this forum and not necessarily raise them in other forums where it could yeah, it could be taken as, as kind of you know, putting some pressure on an administrator. So, does that work though? So, if we look at Bridget's example, um, just with the library staffing. So, if we come to the board and we decide to start talking about library staffing, all of a sudden, aren't we getting outside the bounds of policy governance or governance by policy, whatever we're calling it, and kind of making more directives for Libby to implement rather than? Us kind of trusting. Wouldn't that be a board conversation of is this a board is this something that the board in the whole is very interested in learning or yeah. you, Ryan, are interested in learning? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's you're a librarian, that's you care a lot about library. libraries and sometimes that doesn't Yeah, well and that's another interesting line too. Like you, you obviously you, know, you, you, you want to come in on behalf of the district. But if you're really seeing like a district wide problem and you're and, and you kind of have a conversation that starts with your child and then it starts to get to bigger issues that that need to be addressed on a different level. And then obviously, as, you know, as community members and people interact with the schools, that's kind of how we oftentimes learn of 
about what the needs are. Um, you know, just kind of be mindful of when you're, I, I'm not sure there's a clear line. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a hard role to play, but I, I think to kind of be mindful and be conservative. But if you so. observe something, like the library staff, couldn't they send that to you and say, okay, I'm concerned, yeah. I see this problem, or what I think is a problem, I need some data on it, or I need to hear what Libby thinks about it. Or to say, if I were just a parent and not a board member, I would say, I would something. say something to the principal. Yeah. Yes. And I'm not going to do it because I'm a board member, so I'm telling you, like, is that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll share for the group, maybe a little bit of feedback. Almost a disclaimer of sorts, you know, Libby did bring up. Yeah. I have a professional connection, in a sense, to the school. Um, being the library director at the Roxbury Library, we obviously try to do activities and programs and coordinate things in conjunction with the school. Um, I do my best to have the assistant director be the face for a lot of that, but small facility that isn't always the case. Um, the fact that you have an assistant director is impressive, right? Yeah. We've done good in terms of management the last few years. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, but I've always tried, it's always, you know, the library email account, like it's always, like it's just about um, something we're trying to do together. And I've never had an instance where somebody has expressed to me that they felt uncomfortable or this was kind of gray, um, but it's always in the back of my mind. That, <laughs> Yeah. A lot of hats on right now, and I want to make sure that it's clear that, yes, yeah. not making a programmatic suggestion, but wouldn't it be great if we could do this together? Yeah. But that's it. It's a small town, right? So things are very they're fluid, and, and I think transparency has been my fallback. So when you get into those weird situations, you know, like, for instance, just include Libby in the loop or whatever, or it'd be like, I'm just I'm talking as a parent here, but... I did that recently. I had an issue with a with a with a specialist, and I um, I wanted to solve it with the teacher and the specialist. It was for my child, right? So I was dealing with this one thing, and little did I know the teacher was was copy blind copying the principal because they were concerned, like what was going on here, you know? And, I, and they said, "Would you like me to include the principal in this?" I'm like, "No, I don't think we need the principal in this, right?" And so there's this power power dynamic that people are aware of that I wasn't even thinking about in terms of, I was like, no, I just want to solve my problem for my kid right now. And um, so then I get a call from the principal saying, hey, would you like to talk? And I'm like, okay, right? And so I really loved that. And I thought she was great, Pam was great, because she was just making sure everything was okay, but everything was staying totally legit. The alternative could have been just copy the world on all that. And then I would be like, well, I'm not trying to like escalate this. So it's this multiple kind of thing that gets confusing. No, it's, it's definitely hard. And I, I think there's another line too, which is I don't want to pull back on advocacy for my kid right. because I feel I'm in a, a board role and, you know. You won't. And I won't, <laughs> but, you know, but I also try to, you know, like what would I do as, as a parent to give full advocacy to my child? and. Where, where, yeah, where might that come into like broader district policy that suddenly is, is inappropriate? So I think just, just be, you know, be very mindful. Um, but I think the clear areas where it's not a problem is if you're, if you're talking to an administrator about something that's, that doesn't have to do with your kid. If, if it's, you know, I need information on this. If, if you're talking to them as a board member, then, then the filter clearly goes, goes here. And if, you know, and if you feel, if you get into a situation where you're, where the conversation starts as a parent and you're starting to, to wonder, um, you know, then maybe think hard and, and if it's, yeah, you know, if it's kind of going beyond parent advocacy, maybe reach out to one of us and say, I've got a situation, you know, do you think that I'm starting to go into a board member role? So, yeah, anyway, that just, since we're doing a check-in, I thought it would be good to, to raise that again. Um, any other comments or questions before we go into uh, committees and um, kind of organizational committees? Uh, so kind of two major things on, on committees. Um, there's a question about how to deal with the warning meetings by committees, whether <laughs> whether for the whole board, um, 
Libby and Heather have been largely doing the warnings, but with committee meetings, it's been kind of ad hoc, and I don't think the expectations are super clear. They're, they're technically committee meetings, and technically the committees have the obligation to do it. It's something that Libby could do if there was a desire to have it do. I know Bridget, for instance, does a great job of she just directly goes to Heather. I've done it when we were doing the transportation meetings. So I think we should have a clear consensus on the board of whether the committee chair goes to Heather to warn meetings or whether it's something that that is a superintendent role. Um, I think it's the committee chair. Committee chair, does mm -hmm. anyone? And Libby, is there any reason you, you need to do it? Can yeah, you go directly just to go Heather? Just go directly, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I do. The middle man there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it came up with the negotiations, but it could have, wasn't warned. It turned out it didn't need to be, but I think there was some, some question about, well. For negotiations, it was a question of negotiation session versus co yes. negotiation meet, a committee meeting. Yeah, but right. it, it didn't come up until the, you know, the night before the meeting. And fortunately, we didn't need to have it done, but I thought just given that situation, it would be good to, so committee chairs will do it. The second thing is for committees that meet fairly regularly, um, would it be good to maybe have a set time? And I don't know if this works at all for your schedule. For the finance committee, it does kind of work because we've been doing them before the presentations of the quarterly meeting. Uh, the negotiations committee, I think, is going to be really hard for one. A lot of them don't need to be worn. Second, you know, negotiations schedules, yeah, um, go through the union, and they also, you know, kind of have an unpredictable pace and intensity to them. Um, the only one really active is the policy committee. I know Bridget, if it would, if a regular, we've never been a setup. It just right doesn't work. A fixed regular schedule. Regular no, schedule. it's been. We have these priorities right now. Let's call it one conference and don't. Sorry. I feel like it's necessary to have a scheduled monthly or biweekly meeting. Um, yeah. Yeah. As needed. As needed. Okay, that's perfect. Is there a rule in warning about how many? For example, if you scheduled four meetings, could you warn the four meetings all at once? Or do they have to be warned a certain amount of time before the meeting? They have right. to be warned oh, 24, 24 hours or more. It's good to put an agenda on, so it would yeah. be hard probably to warn four. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. And how far in advance? 24 hours. hours. Except for some like emergency meetings. Yes. Right, yeah. Okay, I think that's the only really committee that meets semi regularly that doesn't have a pretty predictable schedule. And then, so any questions or comments on that? Well, just to add to that, so you're wanting to establish regular meetings in order to sort of have them posted and accessible and regular meetings don't have to be warned in the same way. So yeah, they don't have partly just to like have it more. They, they don't have to be warned in the same way and then it could be something that say Heather could kind of calendar so it wouldn't, you yeah. know. Really, it doesn't have to be warned in the same way? If I said, I'm on a committee and it's gonna meet once a week, a week for some reason, <laughs> right, <laughs> would, would you, don't you have to warn it just the same? Well, it's just like mm -hmm. our regular board meetings aren't warned in the same way because we set a schedule. Yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering about a list of if you had a committee mm -hmm. and they'd already set oh. four meetings. But you still post the agenda. In yeah, you still post the agenda. So yeah. There's other steps. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's like three types of meetings. There's regular meetings, special meetings, and special meeting, and then emergency meetings. And, um, and the final thing is, I think we want to have a little discussion about the negotiations committee. Tina, now that the committee is more stocked and not just Tina, has decided that her previous um, desire never to ever be on the negotiations <laughs> committee is, is a desire that she wants to rekindle. Uh, <laughs> that was, that was like, excellent. Your <laughs> so, that was excellent. Um, so who does that leave? So it leaves 
It leaves Ryan and Andrew, and so I just... So that's two, and haven't we always had two? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so just to be clear, I had that same... <laughs> <design. laughs> There's no doubt about it. <laughs> this is true. Andrew just doesn't know what he's getting into. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I've heard you're doing a great job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to give mostly Ryan and Andrew's thoughts about whether they feel they're comfortable um, as a duo. Uh, and then the other question is, uh, since we are starting to get into issues, um, getting some time with the board to go over uh, what the, the issues are going to be and get some, some board consensus on, on uh, I think how we feel with that. That's critical. Yeah. It's really important. So we need some executive I think probably the fifth. Yeah. Yes. Do you think a half hour could do it if we do it quickly, or should we schedule more time? I would suspect a half hour is probably reasonable. I mean, we've only gone through the ground rules at this point. It's going to be more general expectations, I think, than it, we don't have anything specific, really, mm -hmm. with the exception of some admin recommendations. So, would yeah, go ahead, Steve. No, I just think we should we should make sure we have a good kickoff in terms of the in terms of the in terms of our strate strategic direction or whatever we want it to be this year. So we're gonna need a little bit of time, so at least 30 minutes. The first time. I agree. Discussions take a long time. They do. Yeah. Longer than we always want them to. Yeah, first meeting maybe 30 minutes, but after that, if but, I remember. But I think at the very outset, I think this is what you're s saying, Steve, is to kind of have the general approach ironed That's out, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and maybe our general tenants ironed out of. Yeah, and just knowing what the realities are this year, you know, getting all that—that that takes a while. It might be forty-five, is what I'm trying to say. Never to happen twice, but okay. The whatever you guys have, whatever you guys think you can squeeze in, I think is what you do. Could people start at 5.45, or is that too early? Yeah, 30 minutes? <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, I'm just yeah, thinking yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. fifth is the public budget, pre budget presentation, so I'd prefer not to yeah, that's totally push right. into that. Um, I know 5.45 is early, but it's probably great for living. <laughs> if we can get people here. <laughs> I could be here. <laughs> Maybe we can get a pizza. And is it is, <laughs> is the idea too, Jim and Libby, that okay. we're we're gonna that the administration during that time is going to present its proposals as well? I can. Well, so right now we have these proposals from the administration, and we need and, what, what, what and we don't understand them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you can. So. No, I think they need to be. Good. We need forty-five. Yeah. Okay. So let's do. Let's meet at five forty-five then. Okay. Um, we'll get food. Yeah. And I just have to be mindful that we could can meet again because I can don't want to push. Like, yes. I'm just being to equitable to Roxbury. Yes. And yes. And okay. sick and I can't make a scheduled meeting. Is it okay for Andrew to be there by himself with just one person? Well, um, yeah, you know, actually, we did have three for a while. I'm not sure that we only always had two. Yeah, we did have three. Um, we did yeah. have, there was two. It was me, Jim, and Peter for a while. Sure. Um, I'm just remembering that one time I did get really sick like an hour before we were just going to cancel the group. And, 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 I am willing to be um, like, I would be an yeah, like the emergency goalie, like who sits in the stands that they pull out when everybody else is dead and injured. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when everybody else has won the Powerball. <laughs> in terms of Libby's involvement and the attorney's involvement, et cetera, is that something that we want to save for next time? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want the power, boys, to use it. 
go to negotiations committee. What's that? <laughs> Let, we'll do the whole lay the groundwork next time. Yeah. Yeah. We do this. There's, there's a lot to talk about. I think there's quite a bit, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. I have a, are you about to go to the, net, the last item? I think, I think those are all the items. Does anybody remember who last time said we should go talk to the lions? Oh, that yeah. Shells? I figured it was. I don't think there is a lions in town. I've been is, trying is to. There, is there an elk? <laughs> <laughs> We're good on rotary. I can't find the others. So I think they're like up at the Canadian club. And I'm like, I'm not sure the Canadian club. Actually, they women. might be. I think there's a Kalanis and Barry. I think they, yeah. They're all in Barry. I'm like, I, I just, unless Michelle says otherwise, Michelle usually watches these. Um, Actually, I think it was I that said, did you? I just picked another. No, there's no, there's no lions nearby. I mean, they are. They're in the Canadian club. And I'm, we're not, I don't think they have any interest in okay. our school budget. So uh, we're good with the rotary. Okay. 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 In January. Okay. Thank you for That's quite all right. <laughs> um, anything else? I'm just going to move up quickly before I adjourn. Anything else on board governance? Anyone wants to pick any observations? Things we're doing well, things we're not doing well. Um, I ask a good general question. Um, in a policy committee conversation, I could raise a question in the last, what? 14 months, we've had a lot of conversations and discussions about we're not policy governance, we're governance by policy. We've never formally said, adopted anything besides conversations. Would it make sense for us to have kind of a very short global um, policy essentially that says this is how we're trying to operate? I thought we already did that. Does that make sense or would it be not necessary? I thought we were forced us to define what governance by policy means. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> which which might, might sound better than it defines. Uh, I, I'm agnostic about it. I, I, think, I think we could have it. My guess is it would take 45 minutes and it would end up on a sheet of paper and we'd worn it a few times and then it would sit in a binder somewhere. So it was fun. It just kind of came up, and here we are in progress update for board governance yeah. uh, for a pass the whole board. So. Other thoughts? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, all.